All right, we are rolling again for a very special podcast. I say that, I know, all of my podcasts are special, but this one I've been looking forward to for some time. I feel like this story, when it comes to environmental toxins, oh yeah, I know, you know this, it's easy to go to sleep and think, okay, it's just another story about toxins, but this will blow your mind because I am here today with Robert Balot. Robert, thank you so much for being with us, an environmental uh, attorney. Robert, thank you for being with us. Your story is, for a lot of people, you know, something that unfortunately is not really widely known, but they made a movie about everything that you are still currently working on. The movie is called Dark Waters, and it really starts off with you as an environmental attorney really defending corporations from, you know, government agencies and all of these things and helping out corporations to be okay and operate in this world. And then somebody from your hometown, this man Earl, an amazing farmer with such a deep conviction, he alerts you to something. So I'd like to just be quiet and have you talk a little bit, though, about this amazing man, Earl. All right, go ahead. Yeah. And you're right. He was absolutely amazing. Um, I had been working at the law firm where actually I'm still there. It's been 30 years now, the Taft Law Firm in Cincinnati, Ohio. And, you know, I started there in 1990. And for the first eight years of my practice, I was helping our clients, which were primarily larger chemical companies and other corporations comply with all these different state and federal environmental laws. So I was learning all of those different rules and the regulations and the standards. Um, and one day I get this call in my office from this gentleman who starts rattling on about dead cows and, and problems he was having with cows. And I was about to hang up the phone because I had no idea why this guy was calling me. He was incredibly passionate. He, he was upset. He was angry. And then he blurted out that he had gotten my name through my grandmother. And at that point, I kind of paused and and paid a little closer attention to find out how how did this happen? How did he how did he get my name? And what I learned was he was raising cattle on property outside of Parkersburg, West Virginia. And this was a town that I knew well. My dad was in the military, so we moved around a lot, but we always came back to Parkersburg. That was the the town that my mom grew up in, her mom had grown up there, her whole family was there. So we had spent lots of time there as a kid, um, going back to Parkersburg for holidays and special occasions. So when I heard that, I wanted to find out what was this connection here? And what he explained is he was having all kinds of problems with his cows. They were dropping dead. They were uh, developing tumors. They were wasting away. Their teeth were turning black. And he was convinced This had something to do with white foaming water that he saw coming out of a landfill next to his property and was flowing into this creek that his animals were drinking from. And it looked pretty obvious to him. Here's this white foam and he's watching his animals get sick and die. And it wasn't just the cows. It was the fish. It was the birds, the turkeys, the the deer in the area. And he thought that he himself was getting sick and that his family was getting sick. Yet everybody he talked to locally when as soon as he mentioned who owned that landfill, and it was the DuPont company, which ran a huge chemical factory right down the road, nobody wanted to talk to him. Nobody wanted to get involved. Nobody wanted to go up against DuPont. They were a major employer in town. Thousands of people worked there. Most of the people in town either worked there or knew somebody that worked there and relatives that worked there. So he was getting nowhere. He was calling the state environmental protection agency. He was calling the company. He was calling everyone. Nobody wanted to touch this. So he had been talking to his neighbor one day who just had happened to have been on the phone earlier that morning with my grandmother. They had been longtime friends and my grandmother had been bragging about me as her grandson who was an environmental lawyer up in Cincinnati. And so certainly he could help. Uh, so that's how the call happened. He had, he had gotten my name through his neighbor. He called me saying, hey, I need somebody who might be able to help me here, nobody locally will talk to me. Robert, I, you know, this story, I, I don't want to ramble on too much, but I know already you're going to understand what I'm saying. This story, your life experience with this farmer and everything you've been doing for over 20 years in representing 
us, the people, against such corporate greed and just no interest at all in public safety represents and touches on so many aspects of life. So many things you just said already that I could unpack in terms of people being afraid to speak out for other people feeling like they don't want to lose their job or one person doesn't make a difference and people are going to soon realize how one farmer made such a difference in this world and how he will continue with our work and what we're doing together here and what you're continuing to do. This one farmer is going to continue to make a huge difference in this world, I pray. But how many times people are just so afraid to do anything outside of the quote-unquote norm. They don't want to step out of bounds. And so from state regulatory people, the federal agencies, the EPA, all of this stuff that people have grown to distrust, all these organizations and corporate greed, it all is wound up in this story about how DuPont was hiding all along what they knew full well was poisoning the water and hurting wildlife like this farmer's cows, right? This is not just one cow. This was like over a hundred, right? Oh, yeah. By the time he had called me, this was the fall of 1998. Uh, he had been watching this happen for years. He had been out there since 1995 or so, taking videotape, getting photographs, trying to document what he was seeing. Because these animals were all dying, dropping dead. And, you know, it was uh, it had been something that's been going on for, for quite some time. And he was seeing it happen to the deer, to the fish, to the frogs, everything around him. Um, and so he was just trying to figure out how do I get people to pay attention? You know, and so the, the way he re he figured really he could get people's attention was look at these videotapes, look at these photographs. And, you know, it was incredibly powerful evidence because that's what really uh, turned it around for me when I saw those videotapes. And I saw the photographs and I went out there and, and looked at what was happening to this property. You know, to me, clearly there was something very wrong here. And how is it that nobody could have been paying attention to this for as long as they did? Robert, I want to say real quick, I hope you don't feel like I'm trying to embarrass you. I just feel like I want to say this for the record. I feel like God selected you as the only person on the planet to shed light on this horrific situation. Why am I saying that? Because here it is, a farmer, right? He's talking about, there's something so wrong here, but he doesn't have the evidence, right? The legal stuff is not there. He has a lot of documentation, but then you as an attorney, very grounded in environmental work, legal environmental work, you knew exactly what had to happen, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. I want you to continue this story, but a lot of what you thought at the beginning was, well, okay, I'm just going to go step by step in the discovery process, and we'll just find out what's going on. But then you sort of realized more and more as you got into this that you were somewhat being played. Is that fair to say? Uh, yes. You know, um, <laughs> This was, uh, you know, it, a lot of a lot of stars had to align, frankly, for this story to play out the way it did. And, you know, particularly now that as I look back over these these 20 years, there were so many things that had to happen in the right sequence and for people to have been in the right place at the right time for, for any of us to know about any of this now. You know, it started with Mr. Tennant and, we, you know, with him being making that phone call and just so happened you know that my grandmother was from that area and that I happened to be at the law firm I was at that at that point in time and that this all came out when it did you know back in, in that period of time we were still dealing with paper documents this is the before uh, what 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 we now do what we now do with everything being done on computers and having to be searching things through electronic discovery if that, if this had all started now, I don't know if we ever would have found out what we found out. But it just happened that this played out the way it did, when it did, with the people it did. Um, you know, because this is something that had been covered up for 50, 60 years. Um, and just through this unique chain of events and the unique way in which it unfolded, were we able to find this out? And were we able to finally get the story out? And what you see is this is a story that took. 20 years to get this information out and to see this finally come out to the public through a film, you know, in Dark Waters. 
through documentary, through the 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 regulators finally being being made aware of what was happening, through the scientists finally understanding this. And that's one of the main reasons I wanted to put the book together, Exposure, was to explain how did this happen? Why did it take this long for this, what we're talking about, you know, some massive worldwide contamination? How did how could something like this happen in the United States in modern times during our lifetimes and nobody really know about it? You know, how how does that happen? What are the forces in play to keep the science covered up, to keep the information from the media, from the public? And what does it take to actually get that out there? You know, somebody like Earl Tennant, the individual standing up, speaking out and insisting that this information come out. It was just an incredible story of how all of those things had to align for us to understand now what we now know. Yeah, I want to hone in on a few key points. So yes, like I said, you were definitely the one, you know, appointed for this job without a doubt because without persistence, none of this would have happened. The persistence of Earl to keep pushing you, give me an answer, help me, give me an answer, help me and and just expressing constantly his honest, high integrity self how frustrated he was with not getting an answer, and for you to actually have the heart and the intelligence to be able to do this. Because, again, you are a corporate environmental attorney. You're defending companies like DuPont. It's like, you know what, Earl, You know, go to another attorney. I, this is not for me, which is kind of where you were leaning towards at the beginning. But you had a heart for this because it was in your home. It was in your backyard. So that's why it was all perfect for you. So let's fast forward a little bit, right? You're going for a few years. There's this legal process of discovery. Hey, DuPont, show me this. Hey, DuPont, show me that. Well, we don't think you should. If we push back with legal stuff, then you have to respond. And it goes on and on and on. People have to realize the persistence that was involved here months and months and years. And then all of a sudden, I love this part. This is the turning point where you discovered what it was that was being dumped into the water. Can you kind of go through that in uh, speed play, if you will, with us, you know? Sure. You know, as, as you indicated, I mean, this was a long, complicated process. And when I first started off, I was skeptical, you know, of what I was hearing. I didn't necessarily believe there was some big cover up. You know, I had worked with companies like this. I had never represented DuPont, but I knew them. I knew their attorneys. You know, they had some of the best scientists in the world. It was very hard for me to believe something of the nature that Mr. Tennant was telling me and convinced was happening really was happening. But it was when I started digging into these documents and started seeing the internal files of what the company did know, what really had been happening, that it really, really changed my outlook in a lot of ways. You know, I really started to understand things like this can happen, you know, that this kind of thing does go on. And really was very disturbing, frankly. It took me a long time to really understand what I was reading and really grasp the nature of what I was seeing in these documents. And, you know, what we saw was that that we were dealing with a situation where there was this mystery unregulated chemical that the company, DuPont and the manufacturer, 3M, had known a lot about going back to the 1950s. But that information about how toxic it was, that it could get out, that it could get into the environment and stay there forever, that it could get into living things, including people, and have all these potential disease risks, that was known, yet covered up and not necessarily given to the regulators or to the scientific community. And a community, this was not just, we found out it wasn't just Mr. Tennant and his property and his cows that were being made sick. This stuff had made its way into the drinking water of the entire community and had likely been there for for over a decade. Nobody had been told. And then to realize as we're going through these documents, this stuff's likely in the blood of people all over the country, all over the world, in drinking water everywhere. And it had been known that this was likely getting out into blood and into water. It had been known for decades and actively concealed and covered up. And that took that was very disturbing to realize the scope of what was going on here. Yeah, Robert, this was one, something one, just, not just for the farmer, but affecting everybody. Well, I have one quick question that was in my mind as I was listening to your story. By the way, 
anybody can pick this up. I'm not a big reader, but I love the audio book version. Go get the book Exposure. And also, if you get a chance, just go on to Amazon Prime as I did, which is really what just motivated me to have you on, Robert. Please check out this amazing movie, Dark Waters. You will not be disappointed because it encapsulates so many of the things that I know a lot of you who are listening to this program, watching this interview, you already understand about EPA, FDA, you know, WHO, all these supposed these these agencies that are designed or around supposedly to protect human health when it's actually the opposite. They're actually protecting corporate interests over public health. So you've got to check out this story and look into it more. It'll definitely be worthwhile. But one question I had, Robert, was how was it that for so long this uh, this substance we're talking about, this secret ingredient, if you will, that was making the water so toxic and killing all these cows and so toxic for humans as well, PFOA, right? Why was that, why was that something that was able to go by unregulated when they had all these other things that they were trying to get you to pay attention to all the regulated substances and oh there's no problem with any of these and just go away now how is this able to be on the unregulated list yeah you know that was really a fascinating story to uncover and to find out how does this happen and you know what what, what really it's just a, a it's a product of history in the way in which our laws were developed in the United States and the way in which our legal system developed, who has the burden to prove certain things, and frankly, the way our science is developed, how things are published, how scientific facts get out. But what we're dealing with here was a chemical that was invented right after World War II and first came out into the market and was being used by DuPont to help make Teflon. It was something used in their manufacturing process as early as 1951. Now, you have to put that in historical perspective. That's decades before the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency even came into existence. That was formed in 1970. And some of the first laws regulating how chemicals are allowed on, out onto the market, what kind of testing and health studies and safety studies need to be done. That, that first law, one of the first laws, the Toxic Substances Control Act, came out 1976. That was decades after this chemical was already out there. And really what we saw happening here was with an existing chemical like this, and this really kind of opened a lot of folks' eyes to a bigger problem that went far beyond just this chemical. This was used sort of as the poster child of why we had a problem with the whole way in which we regulate chemicals. This chemical was already out there when the law came out. And for existing chemicals, the law said it was up to the companies that were making them and using them to alert the EPA, if the companies determined that there was some substantial risk to, of, of harm to the human health or the environment. Oh, well, that's, a, that's very important. Yeah, that's, real, that's reassuring, right? <laughs> right. And so what we saw when we looked in the internal documents is every time these studies were being done that showed risk of harm and health threat, the companies were deciding internally, we don't think this presents a risk, so we're not required to report it to the EPA. That went on for decades. And when we finally gave those documents to the EPA, decades later, when I found them and started giving them to the EPA, the EPA actually sued DuPont. One of the first times the agency had done it saying, you should have given us information about this chemical decades ago. If you had, we might have been able to start regulating this before it contaminated the entire planet. So it was a just a real problem with the way in which the history of how our laws came out, how they developed, who had the burden to prove what scientifically. Um, and again, in, in the book, we try to explore how all of those things kind of interacted with each other to create sort of a perfect storm of a, that allowed this massive contamination to occur and to, to go on for decades without anybody knowing about it. And so in a nutshell, Robert, I mean, would you say it's just simple corporate greed or just protecting corporate profits as to why DuPont was dragging its feet for so long? Because at a certain point, again, it's explained in such beautiful detail in the book Exposure that people can go and check out themselves. But at a certain critical point, it was amazing how it just like 
you know, the light switch went on where you knew you were touching a nerve, that they knew full well something was going on and they were trying to hide it from you. And even the people in your own law firm, how important was it that you got great support from a couple of guys in your law firm to really let you know, hey, Robert, keep going the way you're going. But what was the bottom line with all your experience now? What do you see it as why they were doing this? Just to protect corporate profits? What? You know, I think it's a combination of those things, Um, you know, because, again, you had this technically unregulated chemical. And so the law was saying, well, it's not required, you know, that you do this, that and the other thing. And the company, unfortunately, at the same time, was doing everything it could to keep it unregulated. And that's actually continuing to this day. Even though we have finally gotten information out, the scientific community, the regulators, the legislators, people are finally realizing this problem was out there. We've got companies that are doing everything they can to stop these chemicals from being thoroughly regulated and to, to prevent uh, you know, adequate protections from going into place. You know, it's, it's just an incredible um, combination of factors that have occurred over, these, over the time. And a, a lot of it, frankly, unfortunately, was you know, keeping these, profit, these very profitable product lines going. Uh, you know, you're talking about things like Teflon, you know, that were that were incredibly important, incredibly profitable business lines. And the company even at one point went out to try to get a gag order to stop us from making this information available to the EPA. Wow. But it goes far beyond just DuPont and Teflon. I mean, this chemical and the related chemicals were used in so many different products over so many years that going after and regulating these things was really a threat to entire industries and entire businesses. So you had massive political uh, influence being brought in to try to keep this story from coming out and to keep these chemicals from being regulated because it impacted so many products, so many companies, so much, so much, uh, so many profitable businesses for so, that have been in place for so many years. Yeah, so this toxic substance starting back from, what is it, 1938, 1940, the 3M is creating it and then selling it to DuPont and making things slippery, right? So, of course, Teflon and your fried egg slides off the pan. Wow, it's a miracle. But the ingredient is part of that. But like you said, it's in so many other things. Home building supplies, Scotch Guard. it's on furniture, it's on carpets, it's everywhere. Just for the record, Robert, is it regulated now? Where do we stand in terms of these toxic substances being used here in the United States? Well, shockingly and very uh, disturbingly, I have to say that no, technically they're still not being uh, fully regulated. Wow. Um, in fact, there's legislation that's been proposed, you know, as the story has finally come out, we're seeing steps finally being taken after all this time to try to get these chemicals regulated and listed as hazardous substances or toxic or to to come out with appropriate drinking water guidelines. And again, it's not just PFOA. You know, what we focus on in dark waters and in the book is this one PFOA. But what we now know is PFOA is just one of an entire family of chemicals per and polyfluoral alkylated substances, which is a huge mouthful. So you hear them referred to as PFAS or the forever chemicals. There are hundreds, if not thousands of these related chemicals that have come out since World War II. And they all share this really unique chemical bond of carbons and fluorine that make them almost impossible to break down in the environment, that make them so they stay out there forever, they get into things. And again, as you mentioned, they've been used in nonstick cookware, stain resistant, waterproof clothing, fast food wrappers and fast food packaging, microwave popcorn bags, car wash, car wax, um, you know, you name it, firefighting foams. That's one of the things that people are really focusing on now is PFOA and this related chemical called PFOS that was used in Scotchgard, as you mentioned. They have been used in firefighting foams, which were sprayed out into the environment for decades outside airports, military bases. So when all of this information finally started bubbling out over the last year or so, the Department of Defense went out and started testing around military sites and airports, hundreds of places across the country, and found, sure enough, it's in drinking water in hundreds of places across the United States, across the globe, Australia, Germany, Italy, New Zealand. And everybody is referring to these now as the emerging contaminants. 
But those contaminants have likely been out there for decades. It's only our awareness of it that's emerging. And as that information's finally come out, people are finally stepping forward like Earl Tennant and demanding things need to be changed. We need to do things to protect ourselves from these and these related chemicals. In the EU, there's a lot of activity now to try to regulate all of these as a class. Uh, in the United States, we're seeing that discussion finally starting at the federal level. But again, since there's, they, people have moved away from some of them, like PFOA and PFOS, but they're now creating new PFOS chemicals that are now going out into products. So you have still this real interest in making sure they don't get regulated by certain people. And you've got this fight now brewing that we're watching almost on a daily basis. across. I, I, could, I couldn't agree with you more, Robert. You know the precautionary principle, right? It seems like that is just gone. Like there's no value in that. You've got, like you painted this picture, corporations with huge amounts of money, tremendous vested interests in politicians and writing legislation. And you're going to go this way and don't pay attention to things this way. And this is what we want. OK, yes, sir. And, you know, they keep the money going and they keep the train going, the gravy train. But Nobody is taking this precautionary principle in terms of all the things that are going on. It should be a big picture view we have with genetically modified organisms, the chemicals in vaccines, all the chemicals in our environment. We allow all of this and still pervasively people are told, I'm sure I'm not telling you something you don't know. Oh, Robert, just relax. It's just a little bit. And it's only this many parts per billion. Just go back to sleep. It's no problem at all. And they never talk about the bioaccumulation of all of these issues, all of these substances. And we were talking off camera. Everybody's running around worried about COVID when the reality is the most at risk for COVID are the sickest, oldest people in our population. And I would venture to say not just old, but very sick. Why are the oldest in our population most at risk? They have the most years of bioaccumulating all of this stuff, the pharmaceutical medication, all the drugs with the chemicals in them, the toxicity that builds up, all the environmental toxins. So our immune system is so low, then when we get a buggy, you know, it's no wonder you're going to succumb to a bacterial or a viral infection. It shouldn't be treated as such a mystery. I'm sure you would agree. You know, a absolutely. And one of the things that we people are under starting to understand now is we look at the science and a lot of this information start finally starts to come out about what these chemicals, PFAS chemicals, can do to us. One of the most uh, studied recently has been their ability to impact our immune system and decrease our immune response and decrease the effectiveness of vaccines. And it's rather mind blowing when you think about it. Here we are dealing with an epidemic, pandemic uh, that could affect, you know, we want to have a strong immune system. We want vaccines to be as effective as they can. Yet here we have chemicals in our drinking water, in our blood. Our babies are born pre-polluted with these chemicals that can impair our immune system and our ability to fight these off. And you, you mentioned the precautionary principle. And I think that's one of the things I try to really explore in, our, in the book is explain why we have this disconnect in the United States. In the United States, our legal system puts the burden of proof on the people who are exposed. When you walk into court and you think you've been exposed to something that might be causing this, that, or the other, you are told you, the person who's exposed, you have the burden to prove that that chemical is causing harm. You have to do whatever massive studies are needed to prove that connection. The company can sit back and say, there's no evidence of harm because they haven't done the study or they won't do it or they won't fund it. And that's why this, this case and what you see in Dark Waters was so unique. It's one of the few times people who are exposed were able to actually do the studies and get the funds necessary to prove that connection. And we're seeing that still play out. Companies sit back and say, there's no evidence that it causes harm. You can't prove this. And the population that's exposed, how do they have the funds to prove those connections? They don't, they don't have that. But it's the way our legal system set up. And that interacting with the way the science is done, all of that in combination creates this perfect storm of people continuing to be exposed. These continue to come out onto our market 
And there's almost nothing that can effectively be done in the U.S. because of that legal, the legal system and the way the science and regulations are established. And I think people are finally seeing that. And I'm really hoping, you know, through the book and through the movie and people focusing on this is the way it works. Maybe that isn't the way it should work. And maybe we ought to be fine. Couldn't agree with you. So as we're closing out, Robert, talk a little bit about the justice, if you will, that has been served. I would imagine, again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would imagine, you know, the complete thing hasn't been taken care of yet. There's still a lot of work to be done. But talk about what you have been able to do after years and years of such personal sacrifice Your law firm as well, how they backed you up. Thank God for the law firm you were at, how they really did support you the best they could where nothing was happening. There were no verdicts. There was no profitability, if you will, in your legal business to be doing this. You kept doing it all on your dime. And then eventually some verdicts started to happen. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. um, You know, we, we were able to set up this unique process because we saw the flaws and the way the legal system and the burden of proof and the way the science was developed, we had to kind of fashion this unique way of stepping out of those systems and having this science done to confirm what we'd been seeing in the company's internal documents, but have it confirmed by independent science that these chemicals do in fact, are in fact linked with these diseases and these people should be entitled to compensation. We set this process up took many years to do it. Nobody had ever really done this before. But once that science was done and these independent scientists confirmed exposure to this chemical is in fact linked with serious disease, including two types of cancer, we were able to then finally move forward, get the people who had those cancers in that community compensated. We had to go to trial. We had to go to multiple trials through DuPont, get verdicts in each one, including punitive damages that the company had knowingly been aware, consciously aware of these risks. At, at finally, by 2017, in a spoiler, I know those of you who haven't seen the movie, you know, we're able to resolve those cases for about the 3,500 people who had brought those claims. And luckily, that gave, at least those people were able to get compensated. Robert, what, what, what's the total? Robert, Robert, what's the total? What number are we talking about for that? Uh, that particular settlement was about six hundred and seventy-one million. Um, that was wow. uh, that was for the people that had those those diseases, those thirty-five hundred. Now we're seeing it expand, of course, into other communities and other places across the country, and these related chemicals. So I'm trying to find a way to do that for everybody else. I filed a new case in the end of 2018, seeking to bring a class action on behalf of everyone in the United States that has this whole group of chemicals in their blood. And the goal is not to get money, but to get the science done to confirm with independent scientists, have that confirmed. These chemicals are, in fact, linked with these particular diseases so that people can finally get over this hurdle that they're being told, you can't prove it. You, the people who we're exposing you to every day to these chemicals, you're the ones who have to prove these disease connections. So I'm trying to find a way to get that done, but have the companies have to pay for it, not not the people who are exposed. That case, the companies tried to get it thrown out of court. They filed all kinds of motions. We got through that. And then the pandemic has hit, which you know has kind of slowed things down, but that case is still pending. And, and hopefully um, we can sort of take this approach to the next level, get these studies confirming what these links are and able to get people you know, so they're not getting exposed anymore. At a minimum, get this out of our water, make sure that people stop being exposed to these, and hopefully give people the knowledge and the information they need. None of us knew we were being exposed to this. None of us had an ability to stop that exposure because we didn't even know it was happening. But if we can at least get this information out and people could become aware, here's what I was exposed to. Here are the products that these things used to be used in. Here are the companies that are moving away from them. At least if we start to get that information out, people can finally have a choice and at least start making choices to try to minimize their own exposure and protect themselves. God bless you, Robert. I I say all the time, I get a lot on my end at Natural Health 365. A lot of people are so frustrated. They hear stories like this. Oh, Jonathan, what can we do? And I always say the same thing. 
will you please share the show, right? Like my job is informational, right? Oh, Jonathan, how does that mean anything? Well, Earl had information and he pushed and he pushed and he pushed and he shared and he shared and he shared and he shared it with you, Robert, the right person, right? But he was persistent and he went to agencies locally and federally and he never, ever gave up to his last breath That's the way he was, one man. And so I tell people all the time, you must increase awareness. I, I want to get your feeling about this, Robert, because it seems like such a pansy answer. You know, awareness, we got to throw him in jail. We got to da, 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 da. No, how do you do that if more people don't become aware of the problem to begin with? What's your thoughts on what I'm saying? No, it's absolutely critical. Knowledge and awareness is the key. And I, that's something I've been trying to do for 20 years. You see this in the film. We talk about it in the book, how difficult it was to get anyone to talk about this story. You see in the movie, there was a 2020 episode back in 2003, where this information started to almost come out. And then this case was settled and it all kind of went away for the next 10 years. Getting anyone to report on this or talk about it was almost impossible and, to, you know, it's almost as if this was too complicated, too complex. This couldn't possibly be true. And so you know, it was critically important. And I am so thankful to the folks at Participant, Focus Features, who were able to get the story put into a movie form so that people can see it and actually see what's happening. And in the, in the book, that's the same reason we, I did the book. Same reason I wanted to make sure that that documentary, that with the devil we know, uh, was happened, that people would have access to this information. But it's been almost impossible to get people to talk about this movie. You know, it, it's out there, but nobody really is talking about it that much. The same thing with the book. It's still to this day very, very difficult to get the story out and to get people to talk about it, even though this is a worldwide massive contamination on a scale we've never seen before that's happening right now. It's affecting all of us, yet you don't see much discussed about it at all. Um, so anything we can do to help get awareness and to help people understand the scope of what we're talking about and what, and most importantly, what we can do about it. You know, there was a, a, a group that was formed with the release of the movie called Fight Forever Chemicals, where different organizations, different community groups, different environmental groups that are working on this come together to try to make that information available, resources that people want to know, they can find the information. Robert, if so, if somebody wanted to get more involved, they get so stirred up by what they heard, I know they will if they watch the movie Dark Waters, and if they just get the audio, even if you don't want to read, get the audio book of Exposure. If they want to get more involved, what's the online access? What's the website we should put down? Is there anyone? Uh, I would search for Fight Forever Chemicals. Um, there are, you know, if you, even if you get online and just search now for forever chemicals or PFAS, PFAS, you're going to find a wealth of information that's now becoming available. There are different groups like the environmental working group, center for environmental health, uh, toxics action center. There are different, different organizations, green science policy Institute that are actively working to try to make this information available so that people who want to try to help and that want to help spread the word, have the, uh, the resources and have the connections that can do it. So I would encourage people to look for those resources. I can't help. Uh, before you go, Robert, I got to ask you. It's the one big question. You ready? Have you ever met Aaron Brockovich? That's all I think about when I look at you. You're the male version of Aaron Brockovich. So you got to tell me, have you ever met her? Not in person. We have communicated recently, but not actually met her in person. Amazing. God bless you for all your work. I really appreciate you being here, spending the time with us. And I know for sure this was well worth the time. So thanks again, Robert. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. It was nice talking. 